Ostrom representing the respondent, and this is a certified question uh, submitted by the federal court. Uh, Mr. Polzenberg, you may proceed, and would you like to reserve some time for rebuttal? I'm going to try to save four minutes for rebuttal. Very well. Thank you, Mr. Chief Justice. May it please the court, Dan Polzenberg for Bullion Mon Monarch. And as Your Honor pointed out, this is a case with certified questions from the Ninth Circuit involving the rule against perpetuities. The, the Ninth Circuit asks, does the rule against perpetuities apply to area of interest provisions in commercial mining uh, agreements, and if it does, does the reformation provision of NRS 111.1039 allow for reformation? Let's take the first question, and I'm going to spend most of my time there. Um, the rule against perpetuities and commercial agreements in general is a very bad fit. There are two approaches to uh, rule against perpetuities in commercial situations. One taken by, uh, by Barrick and the district court and by the Weddell case in uh, Indiana is just a hard and fast rule. If there's a provision and for a future interest and it can vest, can vest, more than 25, 21 years in the future, then it is void ab initio. The other approach is to take a reasonable commercial approach and look at whether the provision is an unreasonable alienation of interest. And, and that is the reasonable approach we're asking this court to adopt. Um, Barrett comes in and says, well, no, you can't do that. It's a hard and fast rule. It's, it's enshrined in the Nevada Constitution under Article 15, Section 4, that says that perpetuities uh, except for uh, charitable purposes, will not be allowed. But, but that's not what that means. It doesn't mean that you can't have any future interest, because at the time, in 1864, 100 and, 150 years and a week ago, when Nevada became a state, that provision was clearly designed only for family-oriented donative transfers, wills. Trusts. That's what it's for. It's even in the record of the Nevada Constitution where, where uh, the person who's proposing that it be adopted says, if we don't have this, we're going to have the same kind of <coughs> perpetual uh, family uh, interests that they have in England, sort of like at Downton Abbey. But, so that is what we were really looking at when we're looking at about when we're looking at the rule against perpetuities. We're not looking at commercial interests. In fact, the first case I've ever seen where the rule against perpetuities was applied in a commercial context wasn't until 1882. And that's mentioned in the Colorado case that we cite out, Whiting Oil. It, it is, it's a rule that applies in a certain context, and it's being misapplied when we look at commercial contexts. And that's not what the, Nevada, uh, what the Nevada Constitution meant to do. That was clearly not its express intent. Now, the, Barry comes in and says, well, it, it's a very broad provision. But, you know, this court has dealt with broad provisions before. NRS 1.030, which Barrick relies on, uh, says that the, the common law of England is the rule of decision in Nevada. But, even, but this court has made clear that it won't apply in Rupert versus Stein. It wouldn't apply the spousal privilege in an automobile accident case because insurance is involved. The court said it's going to look up, up at the conditions that are involved. And so let's look at the conditions that are involved here. Commercial transactions, it makes no sense to limit a future interest to a life in being or to 21 years which is the common law age of majority. These are concepts that apply only when we're dealing about family donative transfers, and that's not what we're dealing with here at all. Mr. Pilsenberg, in what, upon what authority do you make the distinction that that rule does not apply or should not apply um, in the commercial mining sector? I have a number of cases, but the, the case that I like the best that we cite in our reply brief because it was decided in March is the Whiting Oil case. We cited the Colorado Court of Appeals case in our opening brief, uh, which had to do with the Reformation issue. And in March of this year, the Colorado Supreme Court, sub decided 
Atlantic Richfield v. Whiting Oil, and it sets out the entire history of how courts have struggled with the rule against perpetuities, how it doesn't make sense to apply it in a commercial context, and how courts, first, how academics and commentators have talked about how there should be a change in the rule, and how even the Colorado Supreme Court itself, it admitted it was applying the rule against perpetuities in commercial context when it shouldn't have been. It should have been applying the rule against unreasonable alienation. So it sets out its own history and the history of all the decisions. I also think there's support for my position in the statutory rule against perpetuities in NRS 111, where the Nevada legislature came in and codified that the rule against perpetuities applies in the situation of donative transfers. More accurately, in 111.1037, it said it does not apply to non-donative transfers. Now, Barrett comes in and says, well, what that really means is that the reasonable approach in the statute, the more generous approach, the lenient and liberal approach that loosens up the rule against perpetuities, it only applies in the context of wills and trusts, but the rigid, hard and fast rule still applies in commercial transactions. That doesn't make any sense. Why would we apply the old, harsh, absurd rule in commercial transactions and a more reasonable rule for wills and trusts? And besides, when Nevada adopted the uniform statutory rule against perpetuities, it expressly in 111.103 subsection B said that it's going to, it should be interpreted to be consistent with the other states that have adopted it. And that would say, no, it doesn't apply to commercial transactions. Now, they come in and say, well, when Nevada adopted the statutory rule against perpetuities, it didn't adopt section 9, which says that it repeals and overrules the common law rule against perpetuities. We've set out several hypotheses for why Nevada didn't do that. One was that, well, the rule against perpetuities, when it was adopted in the Constitution, didn't apply in commercial transactions. But I really think the more reasonable approach is the Nevada legislature couldn't repeal the common law rule against perpetuities because the common law rule was in the Constitution. But it clarified what the common law rule was and that it only applies in the sense of commercial transactions, or it only applies outside commercial transactions to family-oriented donative transactions. And what I'm arguing makes even more sense when we're dealing with an area of interest provision. Mr. Poulsenberg, on that issue, there's some discussion in reference as the rules of perpetuity. We have a contract interest, first interest in land. Yes. What's your take on that? I argued in my opening brief that this could be construed as a contract interest only, and therefore the rule against perpetuities wouldn't apply. But honestly, it does seem like this Court has held that interests, mining interests, are associated enough with the land that I don't think that I have the best argument there. But because it is a contract interest, I do think the rule against perpetuities should not apply to it. I don't think it's automatically exempted because it has nothing to do with the land, but I do think the Court should make the distinction about how the rule against perpetuities doesn't apply to commercial transactions. And I think that point is especially well made when we're dealing with area of interest provisions in commercial mining leases. There are a line of cases. It starts with Hansen v. Ware, Arkansas, in 1955, where it talks about the importance of royalty provisions and royalty interests. And that goes on to Denny v. Teal, the Oklahoma 1985 case. Alabama, also in Dauphin Island, comes up. And all these cases lead to the Commerce Bank case, which is one of the two cases set out by the Ninth Circuit, the Missouri case, 
from 1993. But what we're looking at here is an important provision. What happens in this situation is the predecessors of these two parties came together and entered into a joint venture agreement. And they said, okay, here's the subject property. We're contributing land. We at Bullion are bringing in other people who are contributing land. And we get two things out of that. We get a royalty interest in that subject property. And we also create an area of interest, eight miles on any side of the subject property, a total of 255 square miles, where if a barrack through its predecessor acquires any mining interests there and develops them, and we correspondingly give up any interest in that property, we get a royalty there as well. It's almost like a memorialization of the corporate opportunity doctrine. And yet, so it aids in the development of mining. It's important for these developments. But Barrick comes in and says, no, 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 it's a hard and fast rule. They admit it's important provision. They admit it's a common provision. But they say, well, any good lawyer can contract enough so that it isn't a problem by putting a savings clause in there and saying that, well, it would be the acquisition of any interest of 21 years. What they're basically saying is that the fairness of this provision, the consideration that we've agreed to get to enter into this joint venture agreement, depends on who has a better lawyer. And that just can't be the situation. Your Honor, I'd like to save the balance of my time. Thank you. Mr. Wickstrom. In my briefs, I criticized Barrick's position for being rigid and mechanical. It seems now to be incredibly technical. With the litany of statutes that they set out, and let me be clear, those statutes aren't cited in any of their briefs. They're cited on pages five and six of my reply brief for the reasons that Justice Pickering said. What we're looking at here is a question of what did the common law embodied in the Constitution, what did it mean before 1987 with the passage of the statutory rule against perpetuities? And I say that this Court should interpret that rule to be that it doesn't apply to commercial transactions, or if it applies to some commercial transactions, not to area of interest provisions in commercial mining leases. And I set out all these statutes, not 456, nobody set that out, but I set out 116 and 117 to point out that where the legislature created exceptions to the rule against perpetuities, the rule against perpetuities cannot be absolute. And you're in the same position the Colorado Supreme Court was in in Whiting Oil, where the Court said we're not going to look at the Reformation issue, we're going to interpret the pre-statute common law and say the rule against perpetuities does not apply to commercial transactions generally, and there are two preemptive rights under oil and gas leases, which is a very similar situation. That's what I'm asking this Court to do right off the bat. Now, and clearly, Justice Douglas, there is enough of an issue here that the three judges on the Ninth Circuit did not feel comfortable making the eerie guess. This is not some clear-cut decision that's easy to make where you just say there's a hard and fast rule. Commentators and courts for years, for 50 years, have found problems with the rule against perpetuities in application in this kind of situation. Legislature since 1986, our legislature in 1987, have passed statutes to say that the rule against perpetuities does not apply in non-donative situations. Mr. Ponsenberg, it was offered to us that there was a 1932 and 1967 Nevada cases that clarified this issue. The Atkins case in 1932, this Court said that the rule against perpetuities did not apply. Now, they didn't go into the situation of it shouldn't apply to any commercial transaction, but that's the same situation that Colorado Supreme Court was in 
in Whiting Oil, where it set out its history of the cases where it did analyze commercial transactions under the rule against perpetuities and said it was wrong to have done that, that it really should have analyzed them under the rule of unreasonable restrictions and restraints. And in Moore in 1967, this court simply said that you can't have an option for a perpetual option for an unlimited time. It didn't say it violated the rule against perpetuities. It cited CJS, which mentioned the rule against perpetuities. But the Colorado Supreme Court was in the same situation where it said that an unlimited option was void under the rule of unreasonable restraints. So Moore and Moore Park did not address that situation. It really didn't. Thank you, Your Honor. Thank you, Mr. Paulson. Again, you're always doing excellent arguments.